Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Jelic, and I'm an architect in this two-person team with Giovanni Vicato. Um, what I would like to share with you today are some ideas con uh, that are concerned with the power of architecture to structure experience of space and time, and how this architect's capacity can be described from the embodied and active perspective. So, specifically, my aim is to uh, illustrate, uh, by using an active approach, uh, how architects exploit, often intuitively, the conditions of human embodiment in order to create specific experiential scenarios um, that enable the visitor or the user to uh, experience moments of authentic being. And uh, now, before looking for answers regarding the nature of narrative architectural experiences, um, an important question to be asked is uh, what architects believe that their design should accomplish in the first place. Um, architecture is, of, is often de uh, defined as an existential art because it accommodates at the same time both the living and the lived body. Uh, on the one hand, it uh, shelters the biological organism, and on the other, uh, it uh, houses a world of ideas and memories precisely because it is inextricably linked for our embodied existence to the way we think and behave. And as it was expressed nicely by a well-known uh, scholar of architecture, Alberto Perez Gomez, uh, architecture aims to communicate not a particular meaning, but rather a possibility of recognizing ourselves as complete and as having an existential foothold in space and time. And in this sense, architects' design intentions are to be understood not only as a solution to functional requirements, but also as a scenario for users' emotional experience and physical expression of being in the world. And now, in order to capture these regions of architecture, uh, the embodied and active approach is proposed as a framework for studying architectural experience for two key reasons. So first, uh, it uh, emphasizes the intrinsic and dynamic relationship between mind, body, and the world, or in this case, the built environment, uh, which is primarily shaped on the basis of human embodiment. And secondly, the embodied and active approach uh, has a strong foothold in phenomenological thinking that corresponds to an existing phenomenological discourse in architecture. And therefore, the idea is to uh, use this uh, existing uh, access to designerly ways of knowing uh, as a head start in build this, building this interdisciplinary common ground. Now, um, by embracing this embodied and active perspective and the idea of architecture as a design interaction between uh, life and form, uh, we describe architectural experience as originating in the pre-reflective architecture body communication. Uh, explain in a few words, uh, what this means is that in our analysis, the architectural experience in subject is conceived as the inactive, embodied, emotional, and situated agent in the world who engages with architectural affordances as understood as designing possibilities for action. Uh, and for the rest of my talk, the concepts of body scheme and implicit corporeal imagination will be particularly relevant, so I'll just take a moment to briefly uh, clarify these ideas. So, Speaking in active terms, uh, this intrinsic coupling between emotion, in, between perception, action, and emotion um, is fundamental for capturing our reality as lead bodies and experiencing subjects. And at the level of the organism as a whole, it is organized for the functional mechanism or body schema. And for the purposes of describing our textual experience, uh, the body schema is understood as having two uh, fundamental functions. So the first one is um, that it is responsible for unconscious and close to automatic tracing of bodily states and uh, positions as we engage with the world. And the second one is that the body schema plays a fundamental role uh, in providing us with a minimum, minimal sense of self, that is, uh, with the capacity of pre-reflective awareness of ourselves as a, uh, bodily subjects. So, based on such functionality, uh, the body scheme is considered as being at the essence of arti pre reflective architecture body communication. And as exemplified in this uh, Daniel Libeskid's Garden of Exile, uh, this tilted surface acts as a direct and powerful corporeal suggestion of instability and security. So, uh, by acting on our bo uh, bodily systems, uh, this, this, this spatial construction uh, invokes in, in the visitor uh, the feelings of discomfort and disturbance, and I in extension, uh, it is possible for, for a visitor to experience uh, this design intention of um, creating the atmosphere of existential fears. Now, uh, one of the remarkable examples of um, architects' uh, attunement and intuitive understanding of people's bodily and emotional uh, mechanisms uh, can be found in the case of narrative architecture. And as exemplified in a classical Corbusian architectural promenade, 
uh, narrative environments assume a design strategy of gradual unfolding of spaces of use, uh, which is with the new movement transformed into a sequence of time. And for this reason, this design act is also known as a temporalization of architectural experience. Uh, and it has been suggested that um, uh, this, um, this kind of spatial itinerary originates in the human preference for exploration, discovery, and storytelling. Um, importantly, uh, this changing uh, spatial and temporal rhythm is a direct expression of artist's design intentions. Uh, it, and moreover, it is a spatial and experiential scenario which is presented to the subject as a, a scenario of affordances. Uh, and uh, these design principles have been used in many architectural masterpieces, as you have seen also today in the videos by Stephen Hall, and including the here analyzed uh, Water Temple by Tadao Ando and the uh, Brian Cemetery by Carlos Carpa. And what we want to propose here is that uh, the inactive and body approach can be used to uh, indicate how such narrative environments invoke in the user memorable ex uh, emotional and uh, memorable experiences. Uh, as these images illustrate, uh, the spatial itinerary of the water temple begins by walking between two diverging concrete walls, uh, followed by a sharp turn of the path and the appearance of a vast water surface. Suddenly, uh, the, narrow, uh, the visitor encounters the narrow stairs ascending into the belly of the building. And uh, once inside, after a couple more turns along the narrow corridor, uh, the temple chamber opens up for the visitor, uh, which is flooded in low sunlight and diffusing red glow from the timber structure. And in this way, uh, the sense of mystery and anticipation is slowly built as the person moves through the actual setting uh, and culminates in intense feelings of sacredness and otherworldliness. And the key aspect that contributes to these uh, profound feelings uh, lie in our subjective experience of time. Uh, so as studies in time perception have showed, uh, the, the perceived time duration is affected by several factors, including arousal, uh, and effective balance, attention, and uh, the amount of information processing. And um, the exact, currently, the exact neurological model is uh, yet to be agreed upon, but uh, we would like to propose two hypotheses that can be pertinent to narrative architecture. Uh, so first the idea is that uh, the sudden and uh, ambiguous spatial scenes uh, capture visitors' attention and cause a gradual uh, increase in arousal levels. Uh, which in turn like this our subjective experience of time and boosts the feelings of suspense. And the second idea is that, um, as recent evidence suggests, is that the motor system, and in particular the supplementary motor area, uh, is engaged through action in order to build uh, the sensory representation of time. Or in other words, this means that uh, our sense of time is acquired through action, which is an insight directly in line with Tadao Ando's own understanding, understanding that architecture activates time. Now, similarly, in the case of uh, Carlos Carpa's Brian Cemetery, uh, the experience of space and time is directly structured on the basis of interaction between the, our embodiment and design spatial affordances. Uh, and a clear example of how architectural spaces affect the body scheme and extension or state of mind uh, can be found in the design of Scarpa's peculiar stairs. Uh, the atypical design, where each step is dedicated to stepping with either left or right foot, requires the per person to take a short and quick reflective stance in order to recalculate the body's position uh, and uh, you know, to be able to overcome this unexpected disruption of habitual movements. Uh, and therefore, for body schema, uh, architecture's embodied cues activate the tensional switch and create a time delay that's allowing the visitor to, to uh, consciously experience the architectural setting and become aware of oneself as an experiencing subject. And this architecture's capacity is in accordance with recent findings that the subjective time duration uh, is generally expanded for salient and perceptually vivid stimuli that are the focus of attention. Uh, and uh, this, where this attentional shift is driven by uh, exogenous spatial temporal cues or endogenous shifts in focus. And moreover, uh, there is increasing evidence that uh, the same brain networks underline uh, time, time perception, body awareness, and attentional control. So specifically, the anterior insula, which uh, it controls integration of affective and interoceptive states in the, and is associated with the sentient self, uh, also seems to have a fundamental role in our sense of time. Uh, and in this way, uh, it, it, it seems that there is a clear connection between attention to bodily signals and our subjective time experience, 
uh, indicating that this hypothesis that uh, architectural skills such as carpal stairs uh, can directly affect time perception and immerse us in the present moment. Now, on the whole, uh, the Brian Cemetery was intended by the architect to be experienced as a place for the contemplation. And given this described uh, distortions of time experience, it is also it's interesting to compare these results of this, this design strategy with, uh, with the recent insights from uh, research on mindfulness meditation. So uh, specifically, uh, the studies have shown that uh, these altered states of consciousness um, are characterized by an increased awareness to our bodily states, uh, which uh, leads to the slowing of experiential time and the expansion of the present moment, and that it can culminate in the impression that the time stands still and that the self becomes one with the world. Now, in sum, um, the, experiential, the experience of spatial narratives in uh, Andos and uh, Scarpa's uh, architectural works uh, can be identified as an anticipatory process of sense-making uh, where the subjective experience of time it corresponds to careful orchestration of spatial sequences uh, slowly building from the feelings of uh, suspense to all water and contemplation. Uh, there are two important points to be taken from this. Uh, first, the narrative environments modulate our experience of space and time uh, by acting on our bodily and emotional mechanisms and by creating uh, instances of heightened awareness. And uh, these so-called moments of authentic being have been recognized by philosophers such as John Dewey and Martin Heidegger as uh, underlying profound aesthetic experience and uh, being, uh, having a fundamental role in, uh, uh, in, in the capacity of art to create meaning in human life. And secondly, because of the fundamental relationship between uh, the narrative sense of self and uh, experiences by an embodied agent, uh, narrative architecture is capable to integrate the experience of spatial scenarios with the stories of people, their memories, and culture. And therefore, it is in this sense that uh, the history of architecture is, in fact, a history of our embodied experiences. Now, and following this idea that the subjective experience of time uh, is uh, an important quality for, of the overall uh, built environment, I would like to conclude with a couple of thoughts and future perspectives. So, for instance, the insights from uh, time cognition and further research in architectural context uh, can be beneficial for the design of urban spaces and issues such as urban walking and active design more generally. So essentially, the idea to be investigated is that is how different architectural and urban affordances uh, can be used to modulate perceived time duration uh, to, and to accommodate situations of stress and boredom, for example, by apparently speeding up the time. And uh, lastly, the subjective time experience can also be uh, an, an important question in ecological validity studies on, um, or, or virtual reality studies on spatial cognition and just to ask if there are any important differences to be taken into account. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes, we do. We have a, you can come up to the, if we don't have them, come up here. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, this example of Scarpa's steps mm -hmm. um, and your thesis about it, that it's kind of um, the design uh, of those steps have an impact on how I perceive and how I, um, yeah, how I perceive those uh, myself while using the steps, if I understood it correctly. It reminded me of studies by Peter Bosselman um, mm -hmm. in, from Berkeley that has done these studies on like how long does it feel to walk in different cities when I'm uh, walking for four minutes. You know? And he came up with this uh, great studies like saying that um, if the block sizes are smaller, if, if the lots are smaller, it feels way longer <laughs> uh, retrospectively. So I was wondering if you have considered like walking down such a more empiric route, for example, like um, investigating, well, how long does it feel to walk those steps of Scarpa, you know, which are more complex? Um, as you know, compared to other steps. If this is something that is uh, of interest to you. 
Yeah, okay, I mean, in this concrete example, I was really more referring, referring to um, really ma making this time delay and becoming conscious of uh, the architectural setting. Because if, if you have seen this other picture that you can also walk down, down this narrow corridor and you see the normal stairs and okay, you want to approach them and everything, but then you realize you have to think actually how you're going to stop on the, them. And so these, these couple of seconds, I mean, switch the whole experience of, uh, of the architecture. But okay, yes, on the other hand, I mean, like I said, in urban studies, this can be, I mean, an, an interesting issue to be discussed. So yeah, okay. thank you. You have another question? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, and actually, more of a comment that uh, one topic I would recommend looking into is Mihai Chicksent Mihai's concept of flow, uh, because mm -hmm. while you're experiencing flow, it's another way of saying you're in the zone. Um, when you're when everything is going correctly um, and everything seems to be uh, just going your way, it really time slows down. Mm -hmm. And so I'd, I'd recommend looking into that study, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Then um, we're on our break.